are ready to get started now, and I am so pleased to welcome all of you. I am Susan Ingalls, I direct Sustainable Furnishings Council, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Sustainability Essentials webinar in which we are discussing circularity in furnishings with Janie Fasciola, who is our guest presenter today. So thank you all very much for being here. We're glad for you to be part of the discussion. I do have you all on mute, and um, I want to be sure you know you can send in your questions via the chat box. Please do send in questions and comments as we go along and we will review those at the end and answer all your questions. To start, I want to tell you a little bit about Sustainable Furnishings Council. We are a nonprofit organization working in residential furnishings. Our members are companies that are involved in the furniture industry in various ways. So they supply materials, they manufacture all kinds of furnishings products. They are stores where these things are sold, designers who make the decisions um, to, of what products to specify. And importantly, our members also inc include environmental organizations. The World Wildlife Fund and Rainforest Alliance were part of getting us going 14 years ago and remain very active with us today. Each of our member companies has made their own public and verifiable commitment to sustainability and to transparency and to continuous improvement. And we make it our business to support them and support them in realizing their own commitment. So we provide a lot of guidance and resources and educational programming like this webinar series that we're doing. And we provide marketing support. All our members use the member seal in their marketing and advertising and all members are in the um, member list and finder on our website. If you're not a member, we invite you to join us. And whether you're a member or not, we're really glad you're participating in this educational programming. And if you're interested in what we talk about today, we hope you will come back for more. We offer Green Leaders, which is a certificate program, a six hour, six CEU program that, um, that counts for continuing education with IDCEC and with GBCI, but which also carries its own accreditation. So you could take that um, to learn more about these things. As you probably realize, sustainability is an umbrella term, and there are many issues that fall under this wide umbrella. We tend to worry about all of them. They are all problematical and many of them interconnected. A lot of our work focuses on how we in the furnishings industry can address problems of global warming, can address problems of other toxic waste pollution that is compromising our indoor air, for instance, as well. And waste reduction is a big concern of ours. But the industry does relate directly to many of these issues. As we are a global manufacturing industry, we are uh, using a lot of electricity, so producing a lot of CO2 emissions in the manufacturing of products and also producing a lot of CO2 emissions in the transport of materials and products all around the world. Particularly in um, wood, we have a large impact, so a large responsibility for saving the forests of the world which, as you probably realize, are uh, very important to reducing global warming. If we can just keep our forests healthy and get and plant only a billion trees in the next hundred years, a trillion trees in the next hundred years, then 
we would have the global warming problem licked. So we do feel like we have a very large responsibility there to addressing that big air pollution problem. We also have a large responsibility for addressing problems of compromised indoor air because we in the furnishings industry use finishes on everything and we use glues and a lot of things. And of course, these often emit volatile organic compounds that often compromise our health. There are other harmful chemicals that are used a lot in furnishings products, many of them coming into play in um, textile production or in leather tanning. And people are affected by these various pollutants, specifically people who are working in the fields um, uh, are, frequently suffer the most from agricultural chemicals. And many of us are shocked to learn that even in this day and age, cotton is cultivated with forced labor still in 19 countries. So we think it's very important that communities be taken care of as well as ecosystems. And taking care of communities and ecosystems does involve keeping things out of the landfill where we throw about 10 million tons of furniture each year. We have initiatives to address these problems. The What's It Made Of initiative is to uh, raise awareness about the harmful chemicals that come into our supply chains and stimulate innovation for the elimination of these things, all of which are persistent in the environment and are known to cause harm to human health and other life on the planet. The initiative involves taking a pledge to ask what's it made of and then asking that question to which we help you get a good answer. We are also working an initiative to help save the forests of the world. The Wood Furniture Scorecard is an assessment of retailers' wood sourcing policies. And one of the things that it points to is the difference it makes to specify furniture that is made from recycled or reclaimed wood. Um, the assessment for 2020 is ongoing now and will be published later this year. All these things are important because our planet is in so much trouble. The place is warming up, as you can see on this video of temperature anomalies, weather anomalies, since about 1880, when the Industrial Revolution was getting going. And so we were beginning to pollute the atmosphere more then. And as you can see, since then, we've got many, many more hot weather events than cold weather events. So it is very important that we do everything we can to reduce this CO2 and other greenhouse gas pollution. Interestingly, choosing recycled materials and reclaiming materials saves a tremendous amount of energy. Of course, it saves resources, but it saves a lot of energy. So circularity in furnishings is a very important topic. And we're delighted to have Jamie Faciola with us today to discuss it. Jamie is not only an SFC member, but also an award-winning social entrepreneur whose work on developing local solutions to circular economy challenges has been covered by the BBC and Fast Company and Green Biz, among others. She's going to be sharing her recent work and also her current perspective. So Jamie, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, fabulous. Hello, everyone. As Susan said, my name is Jamie Fasciola, and I'm excited to share my project with you, Love Furniture Lasts, and reframe circularity in a new light from the bottom up, which is an uncommon narrative, but I think it's a really important one. And for anyone who's not familiar with the terminology circularity, it is this concept that you aim to keep materials 
in use at their highest purpose for as long as possible. And it really helps ease the burden on the environment. And instead of this kind of extractive linear approach that we've been taking for so long, where you make it, you take it, you waste it. Instead, they're trying to move materials into more circular loops where that way each material becomes an input into the next. And so I think this is a very novel concept in certain sectors, but I believe in furniture, it's really ancient wisdom. And so today I'm going to talk to you, see if I can get my slides to catch yeah. up. Here, put, click on the picture. There you go. Now we see your next slide. Great, okay. Thank you. Um, so today we're gonna talk about what the project entailed, my observations from the field, quantified results, and hope and challenges. So let's start with introductions. So this is me, I'm Jamie, and that's my dog, Lucy. And what you're looking at is my neighborhood in Oakland, California. It's called Temescal, and I've lived here for nearly 10 years. The project that I'm going to share with you today did not start out with what I'm gonna show you. It grew into a passion project and I gave it a name, but it started as a really small project rooted in healing. I was in a state of transition and had recently pressed pause. Five years prior, I had left my corporate sustainability path where I worked in greenhouse gas accounting and verification, corporate sustainability consulting and reporting, and marketing and business development. But I was frustrated by the paradox of our economic system that demands and rewards infinite growth despite the limits of our finite planet. I was excited by the promise of regenerative business models, especially those that serve their local communities. And so I became an entrepreneur and I started my own company and it was a repackaged repair shop. And I co-located independent repair shops from across the city in one place. And I was able to shift the narrative and talk about waste reduction and supporting skilled labor, the climate benefits of extending the life of your things and supporting locally owned businesses. It was an amazing opportunity to get to know and understand the challenges of the last generation of old school repair shops in Oakland. I also spent time as the director of impact at one of the largest upholstery workshops on the West Coast. It's nearly a hundred years old and had 10,000 square feet. I was able to set up waste diversion programs and do public presentations about the resilience of local circular economy repair networks. And I also was able to grab us a spot that when this big recycling conference came to Oakland, in addition to visiting the state-of-the-art landfill, they also made a stop at our workshop, which gave us the chance to rethink how waste diversion is talked about and who should be included in that conversation. But I couldn't shake the disconnect everywhere I went. If you go to a repair shop and you talk about circular economy and impact measurements and climate goals, they look at you like you're crazy. If you go to a corporate sustainability conference and tell them that you work in an upholstery shop, they don't know why you're there. And if you're an entrepreneur in the San Francisco Bay Area and you talk about growing regional, regenerative, repair-based economies, they don't look at you like you're part of an innovative future. They look at you like you're from the 18th century. I was a misfit everywhere. I discovered these worlds are so insular and they didn't talk to each other. They didn't use the same language and they didn't have any trust. I also quickly learned that there is a hierarchy and repair is on the bottom. Our society idolizes makers, but it stigmatizes repair professionals. Used stuff is scorned and so are the people who work with it. So I started to become very interested in where these narratives came from. Why do we all think this way? And what I did know is that the issues were interconnected and way bigger than one shop in Oakland. And I know I needed to grow in a new direction. I just wasn't sure what. But I do know the moment this project began and it was a super misfit moment because it was October, 2018 and it was Upholstery Awareness Month which is a social media campaign on Instagram. And I was so excited and I really wanted to participate because it's my favorite trade. Of course, it's from the original 
circular economy from the 14th century, it's rooted in reuse and they're trained to make imperfect things beautiful. I think these are all very climate positive skills. And personal side story, I'm actually also a terrain upholster. Um, I spent a summer as an apprentice and my grandpa was an upholster for 40 years, just 10 miles south of where I live now. So this is a personal topic and I wanted to participate and I wanted to amplify their voice and raise mine with theirs. It matters to me that the people doing the work are getting as much credit as those people talking about it. But I didn't have any pictures because I had recently left the upholstery shop and during Upholstery Awareness Month, people put out their best work and so I wasn't, I wasn't sure what to do. And one day I realized walking around my neighborhood that, you know, there's a lot of street furniture around here. I wonder if I, I wonder if I could just use one of those, but I didn't want to, you know, look like a troll and think that I was trolling them. But at the end of the day, I did, I posted this picture. It's this ripped chair. It's sitting next to a pole. Um, and to be honest, it's one of my most liked posts ever, but more importantly, what happened was it, un, it, clicked in my head that that's what I can do. I could just take pictures of this street furniture and just use my own personal Instagram account. I had very few followers. I've never really used it. And that's where I can go to sort out some of these things that have been really frustrating me. And so by January 2019, I committed to post these pictures of the street furniture in my neighborhood and use Instagram as a creative sandbox to explore, not solve, how we think and talk about furniture waste. And this is actually where Lucy does come in, my dog. And that's because I already had the habit of being in my neighborhood once, if not twice a day, I walk because I walk her twice a day. And so it wasn't a huge lift to just stop and take a picture of something. And I really think that enduring habit is really what sustained this project. And it still does to this day. So now you know about the people and the purpose. Let me quickly orient you to the place. So my home base is Oakland, California. As I've said, I've lived here about 10 years. We're right across the bay from kind of our more famous neighbor, San Francisco. We're considered the blue collar city. And we're that red square, that's my neighborhood. We're just a couple miles south of Berkeley. Temescal is zoomed in on the right. It's just a quarter square mile across. And that's where Lucy and I walk every day. And so over the last 10 years, Oakland has undergone a tremendous amount of change. Housing costs have tripled and homelessness has doubled. And this plays out on the street where I do my data collection. I started to see furniture waste as a window into larger forces. And by chronicling that moment in Oakland's history, it expanded my perception of furniture waste overall. And I really began to see furniture as a vehicle for storytelling, which you'll see is definitely played out in my posts. So, now I just wanna give you a quick rapid orientation into how this project was conducted. I'm gonna squeeze 15 months into 24 hours. This is not a representative 24 hours, but it is a good sampling and I think it will give you the flavor of the project. So Sunday, July 28th, we're heading to the grocery store. I'm on the passenger side of the car. I see a couch, I take its picture. I get home from the grocery store, I unload my groceries, I jump on my bike, and I bike up to the hardware store to get a light bulb. I pass this futon, this nicely folded cushion, and there's a cute little baggie with all the nuts and bolts. Biking back from the hardware store, I pass this desk hutch. The next morning, Monday morning, I wake up and I'm walking to the doctor's office, I pass this desk chair. On the way back from the doctor's office, I pass this bookshelf. Later that day, I take Lucy out and we run into this dining chair. On the way home with Lucy, we pass four Adirondack chairs, a plastic pink princess bed, and a foldable table. That equals 11 pieces of furniture within 24 hours, within just one mile from my home. And that's kind of the gist of the project. It's just going about your life in your neighborhood and taking pictures of furniture when you see it. But now I wanna zoom out. The 15 months that this project covers is from January, 2019 to March, 2020, which is when I capped the data. And so now I'm gonna share some observations from the field. First off, blind spots. This is huge. I think in my neighborhood, we are just so used to seeing discarded 
furniture, that it's been completely normalized. We also live in a really stressful place, and I just think this is the least of anyone's worries. In many ways, it's not doing any harm. I also think that we are so disconnected from the materials and the craftsmanship that goes into making these products that we're not able to see past its present state into what it could be, what could the value be beyond what it is. And I think it is a very limited view and it, and we kind of just accept these things as worthless. I also believe in my neighborhood that we have a deep cultural practice of putting things on the curb. I think it's rooted in the original sharing economy and is meant with very good intentions. But I borrow this term recycling actually from the recycling industry. And that's this idea that when you have some plastic packaging that you wish and hope and want to be recyclable, and so you put it in the recycling bin, but in fact, it is not recyclable. And what ends up happening is that you've now contaminated the batch. And so what I often see on the street is that furniture degrades really quickly. And I can run into something in the afternoon and by that evening, it'll be tagged or pieces will be missing. And of course that renders the piece not sellable or usable by most people. And I think that the curbing of furniture in my neighborhood has become a tragedy of the commons. My most surprising blind spot was realizing how furniture is talked about and the reductive language that is used. Pretty much furniture exists in two states. It's shiny and new, or it is urban blight. And it leaves out everything in between. And I think it really limits how we think and speak about furniture. Who is solving for what? This is the question I asked myself more than anything through the course of this project. And in my mind, I think our values are on obvious display because we have figured out how to have anything you want delivered in 24 hours and it will soon be coming by drone. And yet we have no system to recapture, refurbish, reuse, remake all of this unwanted furniture. I would also say people have no idea the quality of furniture that's left on the street. Over the course of 15 months, there were four wow moments that really stuck with me and I wanna share them with you. The first one was when I was driving by this motel and of course I saw this dumpster and of course I pulled over and of course I confirmed it was full of furniture. And then I was invited inside and I got to speak to the guy in charge and after he offered it to me all for free, take it, you want it, it's yours, great. Which of course I didn't, but then he calmed down and plainly explained to me that it is cheaper to buy new than it is to pick up, store, clean, and reuse old furniture. And it's such a good reminder how rampant this is, though I, you know, most of my photos are just in my neighborhood, which is of course pretty residential, but how rampant it is also in the commercial and hospitality industries as well. And I think this is the crux of, right, this circular challenge is what do we do when we want to extend the life of these things, but it is cheaper to buy new and all systems encourage and incentivize that behavior. A couple weeks passed and they, they were gone and the dumpster had left. And I just, I don't know why these three chairs were left behind. And it always just made me so sad that somehow they just, they weren't even good enough to make it in the dumpster. It was sad. The second wow moment is, this is a homeless camp and it's right off the 580 freeway at the Harrison exit, if anyone knows where that is. And you can see in this photo that there's six pieces of furniture. There's four dining chairs, a sofa and an office chair. And there's a little handmade sign and it says, for sale, 350 OBO or best offer. And I think this is such a powerful, poignant image that shows that value is relative. And these homeless, this homeless camp is selling used furniture because they see value in it. My wow moment number three are bulky waste pickups. I'm assuming maybe most people are familiar with this. I think this is a pretty common practice across the country. Where I live, I believe you get two a year. I live in an apartment, so I don't know. But what I do know is that you just get to create these little mini landfills. And speaking to friends who use them, 
it was very interesting when they didn't realize that because the way it's marketed as it's the right thing to do and it's so friendly and it's great that it actually all just goes to the landfill. And so again, with a circular mindset, the idea that all of this garbage is the same or that it's all garbage at all is such a blind spot and it is a best practice approach that will definitely need another examination in a circular world. I would also say that actually Instagram hates bulky waste pickups. They don't like them. I think they just make everyone feel bad. My last wow moments um, are personal. And as, you, as I told you, this project started very small and very personal. Um, but amazingly, actually, people showed up. A pollster showed up and they loved it and they liked it and they shared it and they supported it. And it was, you know, it was really amazing. And then I was lucky enough to be featured on this local podcast here on KQED Radio in the fall and, and new people showed up and they were not furniture people. And these are just people who care about the materials and the planet and their community. And at that time I had kind of started true to the spirit of the content being a creative sandbox. I had started using these photos as like creative prompts. <laughs> at that time I'd moved away from more kind of economic and societal commentary and had started to personify the furniture. And I gave them voices and all kinds of silly things. And I really was ready to lose all of my followers. And they didn't leave, but they engaged deeper and they added their voices and their captions. And it was so tremendous. And I'd never, I couldn't have imagined that would be what would come of this. The second thing that has to be mentioned is the launch of the National Upholstery Association. And I am very proud to say that I am on the board of this organization. This is something I could have only dreamed about when I was at the upholstery shop that this industry now has a voice. This association is dedicated to supporting and advancing the field of professional upholsters. And now they are able to take a seat at the table and really start imagining themselves as part of our furniture's future. And I could not be more excited. So what did I find in 15 months from January, 2019 to March, 2020? What I discovered were 592 pieces of furniture within two miles from my home in just over a year. That is one to two new pieces every single day. What I found mostly was seating. Second was storage, which are things like desks, dressers, and bookshelves, and then tables, coffee tables, and tables, dining room tables. The top five items I found by count were number one were dining chairs, number two were armchairs, number three were sofas, four desk chairs, and five were side tables. Oops, let's see if it'll go. Do you want the previous slide? Oh, has yours advanced? Yes, we're reading in 15 months, 50,578 pounds. Oh, oh, so sorry, guys. I am way, way behind you. Uh oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let me see if I can catch. Oh, okay. Do you see 50,000 pounds? We do. Okay, great. Exactly. That's right, Susan. In 15 months, 50,000 pounds of furniture within two miles from my home. And I'm just one neighborhood. There's 50 neighborhoods in Oakland. And if we assume the same characteristics across every community and scale that up to the state level, that's 89 million pounds. And if you do that to the national level, it's 754 million pounds of wasted furniture. And though weight is the traditional measurement approach that's used, I actually don't think that's very useful. And so I went through and graded the different furniture into five buckets. I did like new, imperfect yet functional, incomplete needs work, not usable as furniture, and unclear unknown. And unclear unknown is when it was buried by something else or maybe the photo was taken at night and I couldn't really see it. And incomplete most often was when cushions were missing, maybe a drawer. Um, 
most of the sofas around here have no cushions and I think what happens is they are brought to the homeless camp and are made into beds and so we have a lot of incomplete pieces and so if you add up those top three categories nearly 90 percent can be reused and though I thought the number was going to be high I, I didn't think it was going to be that high and I actually think most people think it's more like 80-20, like probably 20% can be reused, but I bet 80% is garbage. And as you can see, that is really just not the case. I also think that this is not necessarily an issue of just needing more furniture donation centers either, because the San Francisco Goodwill has said that they make more money on a rack of clothes than they do selling furniture. It is big, it takes up a lot of space, and they just don't get that many returns. They don't get that high of a return on it. Also, uh, speaking to other friends who have gone through this process, there's a really strict criteria for aesthetics, right? So you can donate it, but only if it is in a certain style because they have to be able to sell it. And so the idea that the durability and longevity is not what is being prized here, it's sellability and kind of the currentness of the look is obviously quite a departure from that circular mindset. And so what has happened is we have 50,000 pounds of unwanted, imperfect orphans. And now let's just, let's contextualize the furniture waste data for a minute. So what we know is Americans in 2015 threw out 24.1 billion pounds of furniture and furnishings. We know that Oakland spent $5.5 million picking up illegally dumped waste in 2017. And we know that if you go through the Alameda County Waste Characteriz Characterization Study, which is the county Oakland is a part of, that furniture doesn't appear once. And I think this speaks to this blind spot that is from the individual level all the way up. It is a systemic blind spot through the whole system. Plus, the metrics I want to know are more like how many chairs are donated and resold and reupholstered, right? Like what are those types of circular metrics that we need to be thinking about in the future? I guess I'm not surprised that we're not managing furniture waste because we haven't even started measuring it. There's obviously a lot of complex interconnectedness in this problem. We have systems, we have climate systems, economic systems, political systems, mixing with values and markets and culture, and they're all working together. And so it is big and it is messy, but I think it's also a very big opportunity to think expansively and come up with inclusive solutions. Looking ahead, which right now is so hard with everything happening and and that's, um, it is a very interesting time. I do think that we have seen an increased importance placed on local resilience. And I think we also can't deny that harm is not evenly distributed. And so though we're in the middle of a pandemic with a looming recession and this upcoming or in the midst still of a climate crisis, we, we do, we just need to think expansively and be more inclusive. And what I mean by that is, I think that we can reframe the problem to be more accurate. This is not a waste problem. This is a lack of imagination, investment, and infrastructure. We created the systems that propagate this. Therefore, we can solve them. I mean, this is really a market failure. All of these chairs have zero market value, but that does not account for the embedded carbon, the natural capital that went into it, and the natural resources. In a circular mindset, that cannot be the case. And also, if this was 50,000 pounds of peaches, you know that all of us can immediately think of three things we could do with that. We could bake it, stew it, can it, and at least compost what you can't make use of. How can we not apply that same level of imagination to this furniture? Downstream is the new upstream. This is fantastic news because we're not starting from scratch, right? It's just, if it's a circular economy, it's a circle. And that means the top is the bottom. And so now the bottom of the supply chain where I have been spending my time is now the top of the supply chain. And it's a heavy local problem. So it's going to be localized. Furniture isn't going anywhere. And that's also great news because we have 
artists and creatives and upholsters and so many people that had been left out of this climate conversation for so long. And it is time for them to be seen and heard and invested in. One of my most haunting memories from the um, upholstery shop is when I was giving a presentation at this zero waste youth conference. It was in San Francisco in 2018. And before my presentation started, I asked the audience, who are mostly college students and some young professionals. And I said, how many of you know what reupholstery is? And nobody raised their hands. And that means in the minds of our future leaders, we are already extinct. <laughs> that is crazy. And I remember rushing back to my boss and being like, we have a really big problem. We have no future customers. We have no future employees and we have no future business owners. So what will it be? Is it going to, is our approach going to be transactional or transformational? And I really hope that we don't take this moment and base it on a transactional type thinking because this can't just be increased material efficiency. The problems are more complex. The opportunity is too grand to just think of it as such a binary solution. This is a transformational moment. We need policies that are going to support this. We need to expand our language with how we talk about it. We need to increase education and training about what this means. And we need to develop new markets to add more people to this conversation than have ever been included before. I think platforms like the Green New Deal that center job creation, climate justice, and environmental preservation are exactly the type of transformational thinking that intersectional lens is what we need to build the future, and one that is not based on profit at the expense of planet and the people. So therefore, I declare a crisis starting now. Putting together this presentation, this is, I went back through my Instagram, my old posts, and I realized how often I asked this, or I even inferred it, of like, isn't this a crisis? Is this, a, who, who will tell us this is a crisis? And I thought about it, right? Like the furniture industry isn't gonna tell us it's a crisis. The waste industry isn't gonna tell us a crisis. I think sometimes we're waiting for a watershed moment. And, you know, in the fashion industry, Rana Plaza happened, which was a horrible experience where over a thousand garment workers were killed in a collapsed building. And of course the sea turtle with the straw in its nose galvanized plastic activists all over the world and furniture is so diffuse it's outside it's at my doorstep it's on the streets and i think that its invisibility is making us miss the fact that we are actually in fact in a crisis and i challenge us to think about this language and use it and say how does that shift my behavior or my mindset looking ahead and about my future plans and so for me my passion project is over, but my work is just beginning. I think these are all just jumping off points, not endpoints. So I'm starting a newsletter dedicated to furniture waste, and I hope you'll subscribe and join me because I believe we need to raise awareness, create linkages, earn trust, and shift narratives so that we can all reimagine furniture's future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation and for this excellent work, very important work, and I appreciate your doing it. Um, I would like to address your questions with Jamie here. There are a lot uh, several questions but as you have a question please send it in by the chat box here's the first question do you see any hope in software programs like cherish or first dibs as I, I see some of the stigma being removed from new from used products so with these very hip websites cherish and first dibs um is some of the stigma effectively being um, being removed? What do you think, Jamie, about those new hip uh, resale <laughs> sites? Right, I mean, that's a really good question. My gut instinct is that they're able to kind of grab the low hanging fruit, right? Like the mm -hmm. majority of this furniture is imperfect 
which means that it shows somewhere and I and it may actually be out of style. So if Cherish and First Dibs is actually selling out of style worn furniture, then I think mm -hmm. that's there's amazing promise in it. If it is mm -hmm. the low hanging fruit of what is cute and hip without too much wear that doesn't need any work, then I don't think we're really getting to the root of the problem, which are these mm -hmm. unwanted orphans that are imperfect in their, you know, in what they are. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it it takes it is good to have some stigma removed, but you're right. It leaves a lot of unwanted orphans. Here is another question about a the challenges in our industry um the another blind spot we're hearing here about cleaning it as an interior designer there's a big concern about how to clean the furniture transformational cleaning and restoring to marketable furnishings um so that would involve some some um, deconstruction of furniture, for instance, like there's mattress recycling in many communities and it is mandated in California where you are, Jamie. And so there are people who take apart mattresses and, and those various components get used. Do you have thoughts about furniture being um, deconstructed and the parts used in the same way? Jamie. Mm. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. And I definitely think it's worth exploring for those that are at that point, right? I mean, again, in that circular mindset, the idea, of course, is to keep it use, in use at its highest purpose for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So the idea of just because a chair or a sofa, etc., might be out of style, I don't think that's reason enough to just deconstruct it. I think that's mm -hmm. we have lots of other skills that can beautify it using it the way it is, right? Like not putting that much more energy into it while extending the energy that's already been put into it. If mm -hmm. something is horribly wrong with it and it is at the point where the only other thing is to break it down into its pieces, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. I think the mattress model is very interesting. And actually the shop I worked at was just down the street. It has since left Oakland, but we were down the street from a mattress recycler and mm -hmm. I brought the our foam and cotton over to them to help put them into those downstream markets. And I think it's co-locating upholstery shops with these downstream markets is such a good idea, right? Because exactly, we're all trying to do the same thing. And the closer we can make those contact, those like connections, the easier it will be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, geography really matters. Here is the next question. I'd like to have some words around discerning and selling quality. I think some of the challenge of reuse is the difficulty of putting energy into an item that is not worthy of the human labor and the new materials. IKEA is certainly not worth reupholstering. I've done a lot of reupholstery and tend to select chairs made before the 70s as many of the frames built later are not structurally sound enough to reuse. Now this, I, and this is from a designer, and I think it's a very important um, perspective on your point, Jamie, about keeping things at their highest use for uh, forever, you know, keep, always keep them at their highest use. And designers do have the ability to, they are skilled and trained at reimagining something so that it could fit into a different interior if somebody wanted a different look. Um, but the frame, as this designer is saying, does need to be strong enough that it can be reupholstered. And sometimes that is not the case. Absolutely. Do you have thoughts on that, Jamie? Yeah. I do. And I really feel for the downstream players right i mean mm -hmm. it is it's really hard and it's and it's beyond any individual to make that argument because we are just swimming upstream there the marketing and the social conditioning coming from us from the top is so overwhelming and we mm -hmm. are so socially conditioned that new is always better when in fact yeah. like you said and i've talked to so many others that new is actually just new we just our system hasn't caught up to that yet to realize that actually the quality materials are older and that mm -hmm. is so um you know like counterintuitive to not mm -hmm. brainwash but 
we're just fed a lot of contradictory information. And so I think that again, this, <laughs> it is very hard, but I think it's more than any of us, right? That's exactly yeah. it. And and I do wanna help kind of add to that conversation, maybe through this newsletter and, and mm -hmm. partnerships and other things, but we do need to raise our voice to educate consumers and others about what yeah. is really going on underneath the, the covers of these furniture because people do not know and we have years and years of unlearning to do about what quality means and where to find it and what the potential of a used thing can be and yeah yeah we have a lot of work and i appreciate your efforts on that yeah yeah good thank you um the same designer comments that her husband has a hashtag orphan furniture hashtag orphan <laughs> furniture. that'll be interesting to have a look at um <laughs> Question, any idea whether or not there are reupholsterers using sustainable products such as natural latex for cushions and organic fabrics? Well, Jamie, I do want you to comment on this. I know that um, it, that uh, 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 from a local business here that I can go in and choose the fabric that I want and choose the foam that I want, but the foam is all going to be polyurethane or perhaps a biohybrid. Do you think upholsterers are able to get any materials their customers might want? And do you know of some that are focusing on recommending more eco-friendly materials like that? Absolutely, yes. I'm so glad this question is asked because the National Upholstery Association has an online directory and mm -hmm. you can um, find upholsters there and they do kind of, you know, position themselves in different ways and several are committed to using these more natural materials. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I understand, latex foam is available, but it is often very cost prohibitive to most customers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, though, so as far as I understand, it is readily available. There is mm -hmm. often a price barrier for many, mm -hmm. but please mm -hmm. check out the um, National Upholstery Association's website and you can get to know some of these upholsters. And I'm trying to think of some of them by name. I think it's called Natural Upholstery. And uh -huh. her name is Carla and she's in Montana and she has a mm -hmm. lot of information on her site and she is really trying to spread the word about the different types of materials you can use in place of more of our conventional synthetics that are really common in upholstery. Great. What is the uh, National Upholstery Association's mm. website? It's nationalupholsteryassociation.org. Good. Thank you. Yes. You know, may I add really quick to that, too, is mm -hmm. that I think this is another huge opportunity to address these, the materials in the chair, right? So there's the, mm -hmm. there's the chair itself, the sofa itself, and we need to keep that going at its highest use for sure. Mm -hmm. And then we need to also ask, what are we putting in it? And the idea that the thing that is best for the environment and the humans is cost prohibitive is obviously a very inverted proposition and addressing mm -hmm. things like that and trying to make sure that we are charging the correct costs that all the externalities are there to make these things more competitive is yeah. a really big challenge and it's something that you know but it gives me hope because the products mm -hmm. exist we just need to work on the systems that will help prioritize the right things for us yeah yeah good this next question is about materials could you say more about recycled reclaimed wood? Does this include particle board? I know particle board is not durable, often can't be reused. How do we retain durability while reclaiming and recycling? Well, I'm going to um, say something about this and then have you add on, Jamie. Um, Recycled, reclaimed wood in the in the furniture industry in general is often reclaimed from non-furniture sources. So a manufacturer might buy an old building and use that wood to make furniture. And the advantage there is it is that all the embodied energy that went into making the lumber is still there and that um, is it and it goes into another product that will last a very long time. Now on particle board, there are companies that make um, MDF, uh, medium density fiberboard from recycled 
uh, post-consumer waste, including broken furniture, for instance. And this is used in our new furniture and you'll, uh, Ikea and Target, for instance, use this kind of MDF that um, is made from uh, old furniture. So a broken chair is ground up into furniture dust and it is manufactured into that MDF. Um, and MDF most often, however, is made like particle board out of post-industrial waste. So there would be waste that comes out of milling lumber that is used into making that um, those, those products. So they are sometimes truly made of recycled materials, recycled post-consumer waste, but often it is industrial waste. And as this uh, question is clarifying, it is not always very durable. So whether that MDF is made of uh, dust that came from an old piece of furniture or dust that came from a new tree, if it's left out in the rain, it is going to um, it's going to degrade and it's not going to last very long. Um, and a lot of what you've been talking about, Jamie, is about retaining the durability um, of doing our recycling and reclaiming in a way that re that maintains durability and maintains value. What more would you like to say on that? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm definitely not the material expert, so I'm so glad Susan okay. was able to address those issues. Um, I the only thing it makes me think is a few things. And one is that these are all just trade-offs, right? Like if we're trading off durability for cost or recyclability, I think that's an interesting conversation. And it's just mm -hmm. based on the values of the people choosing to spend their money that way or the company trying to position themselves that way. Um, and I think having a greater sense of people understanding how to think through the trade-offs of used, dry and killed hardwood wood that could last a hundred years. I think young people today don't think that far. I think mm -hmm. that's a really intimidating proposition to be like, this sofa will last you and all of your grandkids for the rest of their lives. I mean, they're in a pandemic, right? Like they don't even know what's happening tomorrow. And yeah. that's a really big challenge because from an environmental perspective, we want the thing to last as long as possible just once, right? That's kind yeah. of how, that's the lightest way to live on this planet. And so how do we calibrate these, these contrasting things? So I think it's fascinating. I don't have, um, I don't have more to say except that okay. I think you've touched on a really important point. Thank you for the question. Good. 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 And somebody asks, a designer here asking, how do I get involved? I live in Portland. There's a strong community of reuse and repair. So that person would do well to go to nationalupholsteryassociation.org and make friends with the local upholsterers, right? I love that. Yes, please do Good. that. And another designer is commenting about how style is becoming more inclusive so that, again, designers know they can use their imaginations and their skills. Next question, how can local government get involved? Our department provides bulky item drop-offs. So um, in many uh, municipalities, many states, and at the federal level, there are procurement guidelines that we, the public, can help shape. And um, local government can itself uh, choose to procure more products that will last a long time in the if furnishings products I'm thinking of specifically that'll last a long time in the first place, but that also are uh, easy to repair, refinish, reupholster, et cetera. Um, and uh, Jamie, I bet you have ways of, you can think of responses to this part of the question about the department providing local item uh, drop-offs. What would be better? Would it be better for the department to provide 
specifically furniture drop off and specifically that would be an opportunity for reupholsters to uh, take some advantage? What do you think? You know, I think they're really speaking to the big challenge, which is people are dropping off this furniture because they don't want it anymore. And upholsters will only work on projects that have owners, right? They get paid for their work. And so mm -hmm. this is that unwanted orphan that is usable. Yeah. It's just not serving that person's need anymore. And so that's what we need to solve for. And I think yeah. it is so promising because you probably have the right mix of people still in your community of wood refinishers and upholsters and maybe some space, but they need support and they need to we all just need to work together. And I think there needs to be some sort of kind of a pilot project and obviously some funding. Yes. Furniture is big, it's heavy, it takes space to store yeah. and do something with, but we do need to find a system to capture these orphans because the bulky waste pickups are just collecting the orphans before they go to the landfill. And it's not an upholsterer's issue because they don't come in yet, right? They work, yeah. it's like you have all these kind of foster dogs and you're at the pound and you need to go get owners so they could take it to the vet, which is the upholster right. and they'll, treat them up, but that's exactly the issue is that bulky waste pickups concentrates it. So that's a great opportunity to grade it. And, mm -hmm. and then you could use your local upholsters to help understand what is quality, what's worth saving. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you should include artists and things. People have really smart views about materials. And even though we think it's worthless, that is, that is absolutely not the case. And I don't even think that's the mindset going forward, to be honest. So I think there's a lot of room for leadership around how to engage your skilled community in being part of the solution, but you're gonna, it, it's gonna take some investment. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I know a community college here in North Carolina that teaches upholstery and um, they, that it is, is occurring to me, Jamie, as you're talking that they could be teaching using furniture that has come off the street and then it could even be resold through a charity like goodwill or the habitat restore or something so involving players and their imaginations would be an important part of it wouldn't it absolutely the people i've spoken to so many people and they you know there's tremendous guilt because it's big and you know it's not garbage but you're done with it and so yeah. finding a way to assuage people's guilt by giving it to a community college or some other training program or something I think people would be very responsive to that yeah yeah good as a leather supplier we promote the longevity and sustainability of leather versus other materials what role can we play in the circular movement I think this is a very important uh, part of the conversation as I've been hearing from you, Jamie, that um, just having a material that lasts a long time is a very important part of the conversation. It is a very important part. And, you know, it all does go back to kind of that whole life cycle assessment. And there's a lot of things to consider. But I do think if you're starting out with a durable good that or, you know, durable material that is intended to last a very long time i think that is a great start and you should be a part of the conversation because yeah. i think the circular conversation is new and it's just the wild west and it's still kind of forming in and of itself and so um i think it's really important that people do speak up and involve themselves in what this will become yeah yeah good and of course another thing that a leather company can do is sell the scraps for creative reuse and 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 we have in sustainable furnishings council a company that um actually uses leather scrap waste to make a new material sort of like paper is made and so there are those are um a couple of other ideas um, and and we at Sustainable Furnishings Council like the National Upholsterers Association just love to make connections. So if you want to um, find out about upholsters and, and refurbishers in your area, go to nationalupholsterersassociation.org as an interior designer, how would you suggest I open the conversation with clients to reupholster rather than replace good pieces of furniture? I really think it is, um, I, I want to encourage you to have that conversation. I, I guess that 
um, perhaps part of this question comes from the fact that a, a designer might make a little money on the new things that are used, but perhaps the designer is actually um, going to make more money by using his or her talents and, and ability to reimagine a piece of furniture. So perhaps the conversation, I would certainly want this with any designer I was hiring for my house. I would want the designer first to look at what I've got and then to provide advice on reusing, refurbishing, or changing the look of what I've got to fit in with the, the new look I might be going for. So I really think it is in a matter of the designers using their talents in a way that is different from the mindset that is mostly around um, acquiring new stuff. That's my thought on that. Next question. <laughs> Another question, do you believe shows like Flea Market Flip help give consumers ideas of how to repurpose furniture? I think so. What do you think? I think people uh, are influenced by TV. I do, I do. And I and people also reference a lot of Pinterest um, pages that get them really excited. And I think those are great. And And I think most of all, you know, it really is this like wrap around support system of we do need the creatives and the designers to get out there to help us reimagine it. And we need the policies that can make yes. these things be more mandatory and ideally be more affordable, right? Like with these yes. tax credits or different things they can do. So, and it needs about like greening up the supply chain. So that way we don't all have to use that crappy polyurethane foam. Like there's, we all right. have ways we can do to work on this together. And I think the creatives getting out there and showing us all the different possibilities is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, good. You know, we've gone over the hour, but there are lots of questions still. So one thing is about, um, so we'll just keep on going with the questions um, it, because it, there is a lot of, of, a, of a lot of questions here. So um, about chemicals in used furnishings, for one thing, um, if it is foam, if it is older foam, it is likely got flame retardant chemicals in it. Perhaps the upholstery fabric has got flame retardant chemicals or other chemicals on it. Um, what are some of the safe chemicals that customers can ask for in upholstery fabrics when recovering older pieces? So I would say, do ask for information first about the the how a performance fabric is made to perform for instance ask for information about what is in the fabric um and uh you might choose something that is washable now jamie do you have any comments about how reupholsters and refurbishers clean materials or clean surfaces um do you have any comment about cleaning i don't but again i would refer you to the professional network because they okay. will be able to answer your question better than i can great great national upholstery uh, upholsters association.org good yeah and it's good. national okay. upholstery association and here is another comment that I, I am glad to see because uh, you know we often use IKEA as an example of um, junky furniture that is not worth uh, not possible to reupholster. But in fact, IKEA does have a, a commitment to waste reduction, and there is um, there are IKEA frames that can easily be reupholstered. So you are going to have to have your reupholsterer look at it and make sure that um, it's a frame that can be they can work with. But don't think it's impossible just because it came from a certain um, a certain manufacturer. And I think we've addressed some of these. 
what do you think will be your top three avenues of action? We sell new furniture built of reclaimed wood. We frequently get inquiries from conscientious consumers looking for what to do with furniture they no longer want here in New York City. To whom do you recommend we refer them? I bet networking with reupholsters in that city would be a good start. What do you think, Jamie? Oh, um, right. Well, New York City has, I think, a few really awesome opportunity or kind of opportunities, I guess. But I bet you yeah. already know them if you live there. But isn't big reuse? I think that's what it's called. Uh -huh. um, and that's kind of this their their I don't even know, like their reuse shop kind of. And I think it's yes. big. And I want to say it's like up in the Bronx. Um, yeah. And they also have I think it's reuse dot NYC. Yeah. Um, again, if I'm sure that they're struggling with the same issues we are, New York obviously has even less space and things tend yeah. to need to be sellable. So I'm not saying that these people will be able to find a home for what they are looking to donate or discard, but there are some, I think there's a couple places to start. Upholsters often are not connected to that community because again, uh -huh. right, they're just working one-on-one -on -one with clients who already own their goods. But I am uh -huh. excited to think about can, making larger connections between these things because we need to, and we're all supporting the same cause. Yeah, good. And that, so an innovative thing that municipalities can do is provide something like a warehouse where furniture can be taken. So if, um, if people don't, if people have the alternative, putting it out on the street or carrying it to a warehouse, um, perhaps more of that would happen. Um, and and in some cities, um, in many in most cities, I guess um, furniture goes out on a certain day, so that is an opportunity for collectors to go around and collect furniture that they will then refurbish and perhaps um, resell. So anything municipalities can do to support those people would be good. But here's the next question. What about all the stigma of dust mites um, and whole body skin on sofa cushions? Um, what Do you have any comment about that? No, I mean, I think that's, I think those are real fears. And I have a dear friend from New York City who um, it sounds like the, some of the environmental issues that exist on the East Coast, I, I don't think we have the same ones in this really dry climate. So I don't, there's not the same, the stigma of the used good, I haven't heard it as much from this idea of kind of um, bed bugs or, or other things. And that's, and that's not saying it doesn't exist. I just think we have a dry climate that doesn't make it kind of top of mind. Um, but you're yeah. absolutely right. I mean, part, right, part of getting over this stigma is making people feel safe and understand that, that we can move these furniture, we can move furniture through a system that keeps it going and keeps it safe and keeps it clean. And I and I would argue we don't have that system in place yet. You could put it on the curb and one offs and someone can go get it or you know you can bring it to a goodwill and someone will get it. But we have 50,000 pounds of orphan furniture that is not the right style. It is not considered usable or sorry, it is not considered in style, but it is usable and that's um and that's the process I think we need to build. And yeah. um obviously through that process exactly it would need to be stripped and cleaned and it would come out the other end clean and healthy. Yeah, cool, cool. Is there a hashtag you'd like us to use when we post furniture pictures? <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Um, I, the hashtag I use is loved furniture lasts, and you're that's welcome to use great. that. <laughs> loved furniture lasts, hashtag loved furniture lasts and that covers the durability of new of choices of new furniture too so that's that's a very um that's a very useful one yeah um and let's see this question beyond documenting and declaring the crisis what are Jamie's thoughts about a circular new infrastructure what a circular new infrastructure might look like we've covered a lot of that haven't we I think but, so yeah you might have more and there is someone here who is um talking about latex foam easily available 
from acanthusgreen.com and the chemicals again in the furniture in old furniture. Do you have any thoughts on making sure that the cost of that disposal in your city of Oakland, for example, is included in the cost of our waste and that impact people's thoughts about durability and keeping things? We usually had many of the costs of waste. Right. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I know the specifics, but I do think people think that, of course, the other idea, though I do think people put furniture on the street because I do think they're being neighborly a lot of times, especially uh -huh. when it's still quite a nice piece. Um, uh -huh. There's a large contingent that thinks they're just avoiding the fee of properly dumping it. And in many yeah. ways they are. And that yeah. is obviously something that Oakland really struggles with is that there is so much furniture on the streets that then the city has to go pay to recoup, to pick up and clean up. So um, I think, you know, it's it's it, it seems a little bit weird to not also kind of, I know I'm very focused on the bottom of the supply chain, but mm -hmm. this churn of materials also probably needs to be addressed, right? People are getting rid of it probably because they're replacing it with something else. And so yeah. this constant consumption of getting new and getting rid of the old and having to wear for the old, I think this is probably so much of what prompted circular principles of rethinking. Yeah. And often the circular principles kind of are pretty mute on consumption because in a perfect mm -hmm. circular world i think they think you can consume infinitely okay i am not i don't i don't know how all that will work out so i do think keeping an eye on what our consumption patterns are of course however much we consume up top is is always going to come out at the end and so if we're seeing a bunch of this churn that's me that means that we're doing a lot of consumption at the top most likely and so um keeping these things in in mind i think is important to keep that kind of holistic mindset i don't think it's just the bottom of the supply chain and the city's responsibility necessarily to have to grapple with all of this i think we need to have mm -hmm. honest conversations about the impacts we have of lots of different choices and how we can help kind of mitigate them throughout the life cycle of our things that we own yes 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 good so here's a question about how can we recycle foam cushions i think that the best way to deal with that polyurethane foam or whatever foam it is is to take it to wherever mattresses are being recycled in your area but all of us can also talk to our local landfill we can call them up and we can say how do I recycle foam cushions in my area? Because they are going to know who the mattress recycler is in that area, for instance. Yeah. Um, and then here's a good leading question. Somebody says, I haven't heard textiles mentioned. Well, textiles um, or the circularity in textiles is the topic of our next webinar. One month from now, we'll be talking about accelerating circularity specifically in textiles. And we do have a lot of textiles in our landfills as well as a lot of furniture. And we have a lot of opportunity to use recycled textile waste in making new textiles. So join us for more on textiles next month. Let's see. Ideas to share the word of upholstery with younger generations. Doing a survey as you have 30 and under that didn't know the word upholstery. My upholstery business has started to heavily insist someone 30 and under attend an upholstery <laughs> um, a appointment to share upholstery exists anything else to spread the word so i think that that is a very important point and i suggest that this um reupholsterer and others be in touch with your local design society so contact the chapter of asid or ids that is the american society of interior designers or the interior design society make sure sure that those chapters are invited to your shop for a chapter meeting where you can do show and tell. And some of those designers, like some that have been on this webinar, um, and like you, Jamie, you're, you, you don't reupholster all day, every day these days, but it is a skill you have learned. So I think that um, 
young people do often um, join those design society chapters and that would be a really good way to network with the young people. Let's see. Um, will this be available to view again? Yes, recorded webinars on sustainablefurnishingscouncil.org under past events uh, or sustainablefurnishings.org under past events. Both websites work. Um, oh, a problem somebody had with um, recycling kitchen cabinets and finding there were termites in them. That was a problem. So you do want to be sure that um, what you are bringing in to a new design project um, doesn't have termites in it. Do you have an idea for how to make sure about that, Jamie? No, but I do think, again, it speaks to the importance of having, you know, kind of a regulated system of sorts, something yeah. that gives people confidence that they can bring it somewhere and other people can get it from there and know that what they're getting is good. And yeah. right now in this one-off way, I mean, short of donation centers, that's something else, but with all of these orphans, um, that's what we need to build to give people that confidence to help exactly. the material keep moving. Good. And Jamie, thank you so much. With that, we have actually, I believe, gone through all the questions we've gotten. If we did not answer your question, please contact us. You can contact um, admin at sustainablefurnishings.org. And if you have a question for Jamie, we'll send it right over to her. Um, thank you very, very much, Jamie. I, I appreciate all you've shared with us. And I hope that everybody will join us again next month for a discussion of sustainable, of, of circularity in textiles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.